Franklin and Fry. Delove Ithkar, Eric Hawkins, William Irving, and other artists. Island, Press, Island Fort Press will be publishing his and his brother David's The Art of Penobscot Bay this winter, their fourth collaboration. This summer, little curated art shows for the main art gallery in Winscott, the Castine Historical Society, and the Wendell Gilly Museum. He writes from a range of publications, including Art New England, The Working Waterfront, Main Boats, Homes at Harbor, and Ornament. In 2021, the Dorothea and Leo Rifkin Foundation um, honored Mr. Little with a Lifetime Achievement Award for his art writing. Please welcome Carl. Johnson for inviting me to speak this evening, this afternoon, on a favorite subject, the art of this magnificent island in this remarkable setting. Uh, when I think back on visits to the Society's former headquarters, uh, what was once St. Edward's Convent on Ledgelon, I admit I half shuddered. The building was bursting at the seams as Debbie Dyer added more treasures to the collection all the time. Hallelujah, I say, to this new space and kudos to the friends of the BHHS who helped make the move. This presentation isn't exactly uh, what was advertised. I won't be focusing so much on the Hudson River School and as for history of painters on this island, that might take a few days. Uh, so please accept what follows as a sampling and partial representation of an incredible artistic legacy that continues unabated today. With the publication of the paperback edition of Art of Acadia this summer, and in the shameless marketing department, I have chosen 40 or so paintings from this book as the basis for this talk. To quote Julie Andrews, these are a few of my favorite things. That's one of Alexandra Ting's extraordinary bird's eye views of Mount Desert Island on the cover. It's titled Jet Stream and dated 2008. Ting first began visiting MDI as a teenager and has been painting on the coast of Maine for the past several decades. Ever since I saw Leonardo's bird's eye view drawings, she writes, I've been fascinated by aerial views. From a high advantage point, the shapes of land and cities and rivers and coastlines and the connections between them are revealed. Oh, sorry. And I wanted to dedicate this talk to my uncle, the painter William Kingbush, who brought my family to Maine through the gift of this house on Great Cranberry Island in 1980. Active in the New York art world in the 1950s and 60s, he imbued his Maine paintings with the energy of abstract expressionism. He painted a number of different subjects in the greater MDI area, including this tilting, bristling island in Frenchman Bay. He once said, when I arrive in Maine, I start seeing again. This is his island, Frenchman Bay, 1975. The year 2026 will mark the 200th anniversary of Frederick, Church, Frederick Church's birth. And I know that a number of museums are already uh, getting ready to celebrate that occasion. Church was inspired to explore Mount Desert Island by his teacher, Thomas Cole, head of the Hudson River School who was one of the earliest artists to record the grandeur of our stretch of the Maine coast. Looking at Cole's drawings, plein air paintings, and later canvases of the island, Church felt compelled to follow his teacher's lead. On his first trip to Mount Desert Island in 1850, he retraced Cole's routes to Greathead, Sand Beach, Otter Cliffs, Schooner Head, and the Porcupines. With inexhaustible energy, curiosity, and excitement, he made dozens of drawings and oil sketches, some with detailed field notes in preparation for his winter's work back in New York City. This painting, Lake Scene in Mount, in Mount Desert, is among Church's most romantic and eye-pleasing images of the island. In his 1995 book, The Artist Mount Desert, art historian and Northeast Harbor summer resident, John Wilberding wrote, of Church's main pictures, Lake Scene and Mount Desert, 
is closest in spirit to Cole's late Catskill landscapes, the turbulent twilight sky and the man rowing the boat are not in the original drawing at Church's home in Awana, but lend a powerful emotional and anecdotal content to the finished painting. You can see what he's talking about, that, that lone, that lone uh, rower there. This is late seen um, in Mount Desert uh, from 1851. And I can't resist inserting uh, one non-island painting here to demonstrate how Church turned to a sim similar compositional arrangement in this painting of Mount Katahdin from his camp at, on Millinocket Lake, he included the rower in nearly the exact same spot as in the Long Pond, the little Long Pond painting. The man in the boat represents being at one with nature. This painting also underscores the luminous, uh, the term luminous coined by art historian John Bauer in a 1954 article. Lumin Luminism describes a 19th century American painting style that developed as an offshoot of the Hudson River School and was marked by a certain glowing atmosphere created by the artists. This is Church's Mount Katahdin from Millinocket Lake, uh, 1895, uh, from the Portland Museum of Art. Uh, actually, one of the gifts um, that came from the estate of Elizabeth Noyce, who had put together this incredible collection of main art and ended up giving it to museums. An older contemporary of Church, marine artist Fitzhenry Lane, grew up in close proximity, proximity to the bustling harbor of Gloucester, Massachusetts. According to his lifelong companion, Joseph Stevens, Lane became aware of Mount Desert Island through word of mouth and first traveled to the area in 1850 aboard the sloop General Gates. Like Church, he was smitten with the region and returned at least five times. He painted Somme Sound, Southwest Harbor, the offshore islands, and various vessels sailing in it. These landscapes are enriched and transformed by the clarity of light he caught, and they demonstrate his profound knowledge of marine subjects. This painting, Bar Island and the Mount Desert Mountains from the bay in front of Soane Settlement, includes the vessel Lane sailed on, and what is thought to be the artist himself being rowed to shore. It's from 1850. A boat ride among the porcupines was often a part of a visiting artist's island itinerary. Painter Sanford Gifford and his traveling companion and fellow painter Jervis McEntee visited them on their three-week visit to the island in July 1864. The two painters had met through their connections to Frederick Church. They had studios near his in the newly built 10th Street Studio building in New York City. They traveled to Maine to vacation and paint together but also to escape the ongoing turbulence of the Civil War. This is uh, Rocks at Porcupine Island near Mount Desert, 1864, from the Thornsworth Park Museum. Gifford and McEntee made the trip from Boston aboard the newly built side wheel steamer Katahdin, which made daily runs from Boston to Bangor. Arriving on Mount Desert Island, the artists established a routine of hiking, sailing, and riding to scenic spots where they could make oil sketches and drawings. In addition to the porcupines, they visited Eagle Lake and Dennings Pond, today Echo Lake, today's Echo Lake, Southwest and Northeast Harbors, Soames Town, and Western and Green, now Cadillac Mountains. Painter Worthing, Worthington Whitridge, who had traveled with Gifford, described his working method. Gifford would frequently stop in his tracks to make slight sketches in pencil in a small book, which he always carried in his pocket, and then pass on, always suspicious that if he stopped too long to look in one direction, the most beautiful thing of all might pass him by at his back. This is, uh, Gifford frequently used McEntee as a model in his island landscapes. In this painting, the artist sketching at Mount Desert, Maine, one presumes the figure is his painting companion set up to paint on an outcrop overlooking Otter Creek. This is dated 1864, 1865. Portland artist Harrison Bird Brown became very successful in the latter half of the 19th century with paintings of local scenes and house portraits, as well as images of the rocky coast of Cushing Island and Casco Bay, where he had a home and studio. Brown traveled to Mount Desert Island on several occasions, staying in Bar Harbor, 
Northeast Harbor at the Harbor Cottage, today's Cranberry Lodge at the Astacoon, and in Soamsville. Like many of the artist rusticators who journeyed to the island to, in search of subject matter, Brown would bring home oil sketches and drawings which he would scale up to large canvases as he did to produce this painting of Hull's Cove as viewed from the vicinity of today's lookout point in the south. Um, Maine State historian Earl Shuttleworth, I don't know if any of you got to this, but he gave a wonderful talk on Harrison Bird Brown and his connections to NDI at the Northeast Harbor Library earlier this summer. And the talk highlighted his research for an article in the 2023 edition of the NDI Historical Society's journal, Chewbacca, which I recommend. There, Shuttleworth explained how this painting was the second of commissioned by Ignatius Stevens, a successful sea captain who had been born and brought up in Hull's, Hull's Cove. This time around, Stevens wanted to highlight his civic munificence, asking Brown to include the red schoolhouse he had paid for. Many elements from the earlier view are repeated, Shuttleworth notes, but Stevens' generosity is foregrounded in this painting. The new school, painted red and surrounded by a picket fence, takes pride of place for the Stevens homestead across the road. This is View of Hull's Cove with Schoolhouse and Stevens Homestead, also from 1864. When my brother David and I started assembling Art of Acadia in 2015, we made a conscious effort to find images of Mount Desert Island and vicinity that would be new to viewers. At the same time, there were some well-known depictions of the island we knew we had to include. High on our list, David Maitland Armstrong's marvelous The Bar, Bar Harbor, Mount Desert, 1883, from the Milwaukee Park Museum. In his highly entertaining autobiography, Day Before Yesterday, Reminiscences of a Varied Life, published posthumously in 1920, Armstrong describes a life of adventures and travel. Born on the Hudson River near Newburgh, New York, in 1867, he attended Trinity College in Hartford, after graduating, he practiced law in New York City. In 1867, Armstrong traveled to Paris to study painting, and then went on to Rome, where in 1869, he became the American consul to Italy. In 1878, he served as director of American fine arts for the Paris Exposition Universelle, receiving the French Legion of Honor for his services. He eventually returned to New York, where he established Maitland Armstrong in a stained glass company, and actually he, 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 he designed the Rose Window in St. Saviors here at Bar Harbor. But in 1877, Armstrong painted a large canvas of the bar that connects Eden, now Bar Harbor, from Rodix Island, today's Bar Island, which he exhibited at the National Academy of Design in New York. Armstrong reworked the painting in 1883, removing a figure from the original and adding this flock of I think they're ducks, they might be geese. Uh, this is the Bar, Bar Harbor, Mount Desert, Maine, 1883. Well, a couple of years ago, I wrote a piece for the Friends of Acadia Journal about the discovery of the original Armstrong painting of the bar. A member of the Rodick family had contacted me to say he had the original, had it handed down to his family, and it, and it had the painting cleaned to remove nearly a century's worth of dust and grime. Smaller in size, the, the, bar, the Harbor Bar, Mount Desert, Maine, 1877, is near identical to the later picture, with the aforementioned changes the most notable, noticeable. Other details are also noteworthy. What looks like a wall along the shore of Rodick Island in the 1883 painting, I think you can kind of see that. It looks like a, a great wall. Um, well, you can clearly see that in this painting that it's a herring net the herring wear of monumental length. In a chapter of his autobiography titled Some Pleasant Summers, Armstrong recounts various family getaways, including visits to Bar Harbor. He offers an amusing account of getting to and from the island, noting that the steamer Ulysses was known by many as useless, <laughs> and that the lunch fare in the Rockland train station supported writer Charles Dudley Warner's estimation of Down East Maine as the region of perpetual pie.
As word got out of the island's beauty, and access to the island became easier with the advent of steamships and eventually railroads, hotels expanded in size and number to accommodate scores of painters, of visitors, among them many artists. Some, like Philadelphia native Xanthus Smith, came for extended stays. From 1885 to 1895, Smith rented rooms every summer at the Claremont Hotel in Southwest Harbor. He had actually started out in Bar Harbor, but became disenchanted by the rapid development, finding he was increasingly, quote, cut off from good points of view by expensive private grounds. On the western side of the island, by contrast, he discovered a slower pace, and more importantly, some excellent motifs. When the new owners of the Claremont Hotel took over a year or so ago, a couple years ago now, they changed the name of the restaurant and bar from the Xanthus Restaurant and Bar to Little Fern Restaurant and Harry's Bar. Oh well. <laughs> this is Xanthus Smith's The Claremont Hotel, 18, 1885. A leap in time and aesthetics to stay with the Claremont a moment, painter Diana Cobb Ainsley, Ansley, can trace her ancestry to Abraham Soames, considered the first settler on Mount Desert Island. She comes from a long line of painters, including her great-grandmother, Clarissa Maynell Soames, who painted watercolors of Soamesville and also Gibson Girl images. The title of Ansley's painting of the Claremont Hotel's croquet classic, Two Minds, One Shot, refers to the strategic teamwork of the pairs of players in the four-ball croquet. Alas, uh, the hotel's croquet courts are another victim of refurbishments. This is Ansley's Two Minds, One Shot, the Claremont Croquet Classic, 2010. And just one more Claremont connection. This painting of the Bass Harbor March by American Impressionist Carol Tyson once hung over the mantle in the reception room at the hotel. Some of you may remember that. It's always one of my favorite places to go. Tyson practiced his particular brand of American Impressionism, mostly in Maine, and mainly on Mount Desert Island. His attachment to the island dated to his childhood when his family summered in Northeast Harbor. Northeast Harbor was Tyson's delight. According to his son-in-law, Louis Madeira, he would leave by dawn to be set up on his day's painting project by the time of the best light. He would spend the day at the easel battling wind and intermittent fog, then would skip painting for a few days of fishing. Madeira offered this amusing portrait of the artist returning from such an outing. Tyson would churn up the torturous drive in his unique auto, and with the inevitable spaniel at his heels, would wend his way through the tables of a large charity bridge luncheon or garden club, club meeting of his wife's, speaking happily to her and his friends but somewhat impeded by carrying an armful of sunflowers, a newly completed canvas, and a string of tired and fragrant smallmouth bats. <laughs> Tyson represented a trend that would carry through the century and into the next. Philadelphians coming north to Mount Desert Island to take the waters, and in a number of cases to paint. Like their counterparts from New York, Boston, and other eastern cities, they found their views, and then some, on Mount Desert Island. This is Tyson's Bass Harbor Marsh, 1849, and I don't know what's become of it. Hopefully the family saw it, the two family. Child Hassam, a master impressionist, employed multiple short strokes in uniform, uniform patterns using contemporary colors and open brushwork to render the main landscape. Thus known for his many paintings of the Isles of Shoals on the main New Hampshire border, Hassam also produced memorable views of Frenchman Bay while visiting Grindstone Neck and Winter Harbor in the 1890s. Hassam's study here of the cliffs on Ironbound Island may have been painted during a stay with Dwight Blaney. A well-known Boston artist, Blaney maintained a kind of summer salon at his family's home on this island in the middle of Frenchman Bay, hosting several eminent painters, among them Hassam, John Singer Sargent, and the Three Islesford Painters. I love this part. Uh, when this painting entered the Cornell Fine Arts Museum collection in 1957, it was titled The Palisades from Yonkers, New York. <laughs> the title was corrected in the 1990s, I'm happy to say. This is from the Cornell Fine Arts Museum at Rawlings College. 
as the century progressed, and we have this painting out here, if you can take a look at it afterwards, it's really an amazing painting. As the century progressed, Mount Desert Island remained on the circuit of many painters exploring the main coast. Rutherford Boyd, a student of Thomas Hanschutz at the Pennsylvania Academy of Applied Arts, made a name for himself as a commercial illustrator, contributing cover art to the Saturday Evening Post. His painting of Sand Beach, dated 1936, is appealingly stylized with the overarching branches of a pine tree framing the view. And I, I, I've always just loved this figure, which you, you, you really have to look for. Uh, you don't see her right away looking out over the, over the beach. I had the occasion to see this painting in person a while ago, and then again today, in the company of collector Lance Mahaney. We agree it is one of the most unusual watercolors we've ever seen. I am excited that Mahaney and his wife Patricia have donated the painting to the Bar Harbor Historical Society. It is a great, great gift. Bar Harbor native Howe Duane Higgins started off in the custom service before becoming an artist. He painted local spots such as the Stinson and Son Sardine Factory on Freeman's Wharf. Southwest Harbor. During the Depression, he started up a cottage industry, creating plaster souvenirs, including lighthouse paperweights and lobster lamps. Not lava lamps, lobster lamps. Higgins is perhaps best known for this epic painting of the Great Fire of 1947. The conflagration cut a swath across the island, burning more than 17,000 acres and destroying many of the mansions here in North Harbor. According to Sheldon Bothway, Higgins gave the painting to the Bar Harbor Banking and Trust, which donated it to the Bar Harbor Historical Society as, he says, the image of the island on fire was disturbing to customers and staff, especially those who had experienced it. I, I wanted to mention that uh, Bill Bentley, William Bentley, did a lot of the photography for Art of Acadia, and this particular painting was in the old Ledgelon headquarters, and it was way up on a, a wall, and Debbie would not let us take it down. And so Bill had to set up a, a, a ladder and stuff like that. And it really, it, it's really, it's really amazing what, what, he, what he ended up with. It's really an incredible painting. My brother and I devoted a chapter of Art of Acadia to the three Islesford painters, a trio of artists who came to Little Cranberry Island in the early 1900s and painted and exhibited their work in the area. The, th the foremost of the group was Harold Warren. Warren had emigrated from England with his parents in 1876 and settled in the Boston area. He was encouraged by his cousin Emma and his aunt Lydia to visit them on Sutton Island in 1907 and, quote, make sketches and studies in the neighborhood. In his art, Warren followed the precepts of the English pre raphaelites and the John Ruskin School which included, quote, scrupulous fidelity and modest adherence to the literal truth to nature and integrity of draftsmanship. These characteristics underlie the classical realism of his main paintings. The work of the three Islesford painters represents a treasured moment in time, small perhaps in the larger scheme of things, but seminal to the art of Acadia in the early 20th century. Their work is a part of an ongoing legacy of plein air painting in the region, artists exploring new ways to interpret a complex and challenging landscape. This is his Sutton Towards Northeast Harbor from 1907, the watercolor. We also devoted a chapter to a group of artists who came to Great Cranberry Island after World War II and formed a close-knit cohort of artists who created some of their most important work during their seasonal retreats. Painter, printmaker, and poet Charles Wadsworth and his wife, writer and artist Jean Howard, arrived in 1946. They decided to build a house and eventually settled in. Interesting to note that almost all of the wood used to build their house was recovered from the Bar Harbor Fire of 1947. Wadsworth often drew on his surroundings for his art, inspired by a variety of island motifs, including here the Beelin Bunker boat shed, which was once a working lobster dock. In, in, this, in this painting, the fish pier, the central figure looks out towards the Mount Desert Island hills, which serve as the backdrop for many Cranberry Isles paintings. 
In some ways, writes the artist's son, Jeffrey Wadsworth, the fisherman in the painting is sort of a self-portrait of my father, as he looks very much like, like his younger self. This is the fish pier, about circa 1955, 57. With this next image, we make a leap to more contemporary times. The legacy of stone cutting on Mount Desert Island is most visible in Hall Quarry. Granite from the quarry was used to build the United States Mint in Philadelphia, as well as the Brooklyn Bridge and St. John the Divine Cathedral in New York City. The Colorado-based painter Joella Dewsbury, who painted in the Acadia region for more than a half century, discovered this spot in 1971 drawn to the plains of cut stone set among spruce like ruins of an ancient culture. She painted the subject from multiple view viewpoints over the years. She wrote, places will settle in my imagination as if they were people or acquaintances whom I want to revisit. This is her quarry and Song Sound, Maine, Mount Desert, 2000. The master realist painter Richard Estes began dividing his time between New York City and Maine when he purchased the former residence of the aforementioned Carol Tyson in Northeast Harbor from his dealer, Alan Stone, in the 1970s. Since then, Estes has painted many Mount Desert views, including this patch of thick woods in Acadia, a subject interesting to note that Frederick Church chose when he visited the island in the mid-1800s. This is Richard Estes. Acadia Park, number two, 2006. Oops, let's go the other way. Sarah Farragher was born in Bar Harbor and spent her early childhood there before moving away. The place is imprinted on me as a standard of beauty, she has written. Farragher has found inspiration at Scudic, whose bedrock, she feels, quote, corresponds with the home I build for myself when I paint, the ephemeral spiritual home that goes where I go, and yet at the same time feels like that bedrock so firmly underfoot. This is her Moonlight at Scudic, Maine, 2012. Ellen Church first visited Acadia on a honeymoon and camping trip in 1965. Over the years, she returned to visit family and then house sat for a friend in Bass Harbor for three winters. In 1992, she purchased the property became a full-time resident. With her animated clouds and winter patterns, Church's watercolors celebrate nature's mysteries and sacredness. She might be speaking for many of her fellow year-rounders when she states, the park is my world. This is her fog, clouds, and sun from 2000. Many of Acadia's trails are marked by cairns, modest arrangements of stones meant to guide the hiker. Lemoyne-based artist Diana Roper, Roper McDowell's stylized view from Nora Vega incorporates a classic Bates cairn designed by Waldron Bates, a Boston attorney, outdoorsman, and fisherman who became the father of Acadia's trail systems. Bates invented techniques for using granite boulders for steps to prevent long-term erosion, attached iron rungs for steep cliff ascents, ass ass and added cairns and wooden trail signs for safety and direction. The McDowell's painting is a stunning combination of real and abstract elements. As I said, view from Nora Vega from 2010. The Bear Island Light, situated near the entrance to Northeast Harbor, is among the region's most photogenic and paintworthy lighthouses. Louise Warren from Sedgwick chose a sidelong perspective with the beacon set against Mount Desert Island Mountains. She painted this animated view during a Helicar Lahotan artist residency on Great Cranberry Island. Bear Island and MBI are one in her rendering of the view. This is Bear Island Light, 2007. The effects of fog on Maine's rock-bound coast have appealed to artists going back to Winslow Homer and earlier. The painter Joel Babb, a master realist who lives in the woods northwest of Augusta, welcomed its obscuring embrace while on a visit painting trip to Acadia. He had set up his easel at one of the great views off the Park Route Road when the fog descended. He could hear the ocean through the misty veils. Painting in the fog, he told me, was one of the most beautiful experiences I had in Acadia. 
This is uh, Surf Sounds in Fog, Hunter's Head, Mount Desert, Maine, 2012. The fog also inspires poetry. Please allow me to share a fog poem. This is called The Reveal. The fog obscures, but is not obscure. Moist and real, not cliche soup, more like consomme. We haven't the foggiest, except we do. Or at least, you can't recall it ever being this thick, like the wharf scene in Cinema Noir. French smugglers moving booze from the boat, muffled by the stuff. Nothing vague about this fog. We know it's clammy hands, clinging things that curls your hair for free and later completes its thousand veils dance, moving off to reveal what you've been desperately looking for and avoiding islands and sea, world without end. Gotta have some hope. When the kinesthetic tracings and body memories of my arms and hands tense, and it feels like I can contain it no more, writes Terry Hilt of Lemoyne, then I must paint. Acadia National Park, where she was an artist in residence in 2006, has been a talisman, a go-to place to paint. Her image of car headlights lighting up Cadillac Mountain is almost psychedelic. This is a Headlights Over Cadillac 2003 Watermelon. Playing on the colorful balloon shaped spinnakers that often accent the island waters in summer, Jennifer Judd McGee employed an inventive collage technique to add a fantastic dimension to her sailboats and to the Mount Desert Island hills beyond. A graduate of College of the Atlantic, where she studied art. McHugh opened Swallowfield in Northeast Harbor in 2016, where she shows her work along with artwork and crafts by others. This is her night sailing in 2014, <coughs> an acrylic and mixed medium collage on a panel. Shortly after graduating from Syracuse University in 1975, California-born artist Carol Schutt moved to Maine to begin a career as a quilt artist. In 1991, she became the art teacher Mount Desert Elementary School, where she introduced several generations of students to the wonders of creativity. Shut also experiments with mixed mediums, as in this striking collage interpretation of Frenchman Bay. This is Frenchman Bay 2003. The 2015 show boats and buoys lobstering on Little Cranberry Island at the Islesford Historical Museum featured a number of island-born artists, including a remarkable husband and wife duo, Dan and Katie Fernal. Dan's colorful pastel of lobster buoys bobbing in, bobbing in the wake of a boat is matched by Katie's wool and linen wall piece based on that painting. The entrepreneurial art spirit of the three Islesford artists was revived when the Fernals opened Islesford Artist Gallery on Little Cranberry in 1986. Their goal was to share the artwork of the community with island residents and visitors. But a parallel mission was to encourage everyone to try their hand at making art. And Dan Fernald proved to be the exemplar of the latter effort. The sixth generation lobster fisherman studied painting with his neighbor, Ashley Bryan, and subsequently made life of art. So on the left is uh, uh, Dan Fernald's Buoys in the Wake, 2009. And on the right is Katie Fernald's Buoys in the Wake, 2012. In recent decades, an increasing number of artists have chosen to settle year-round on Mount Desert Island, drawn to the quality of life, but also to an exceptional assortment of winter subjects. What was once a true rarity, a view of Acadia that featured snow, is now more common and has led to a four-season palette. Amy Polian, on the left, moved to Town Hill with her husband and fellow painter, Robert Polian, Right. In 1994, they had both attended the Philadelphia College of Art. While specializing in floral still likes, Polian has also painted a variety of island landscapes. In her image of the, Peggy, of the Peggy Rockefeller farm on the Crooked Road, she captures an early episode of mud season. This is her Peggy Rockefeller farm, March Thaw, 2015. Robert Polian prefers the off season for painting on site seeking out, as it were, the bones of winter. 
whether it be a mountainside etched with snow or this blowdown on a little, a little long pond, a student of the famed main, main painter Neil Welliver, he was the first, very first Acadia National Park artist in residence, taking a turn in October 1993. This is his winter little long pond oil and panel from 2015. Another year-rounder, Judy Taylor, explores the region from her home studio in West Tremont, perhaps best known for her remarkable, remarkable mural that depicts the history of Maine labor, which is now on permanent display at the Maine State Museum. Taylor is also a lover of the landscape, finding much of her subject on the island's quiet side and often in the winter months. About this painting, Taylor explained, it was painted after an afternoon skating. However, trucks don't drive on Soames Pond, and I wanted the abstract tire treads in the ice and the shadows they create in order to lead the eye into the painting. These I picked up from Long Pond on the same day as I created the composition in my mind. So it's sort of a composite painting of two, two places. This is Skater's Soames Pond, 2009. From his studio in Sullivan, Philip Fry has focused on the coast of his home state for the past 25 or so years, producing landscapes of Mount Desert, Great Cranberry, and Monhegan Islands, as well as other locales beloved of landscape painters. He evokes the abstract, the geometric abstractions of the Dutch painter Piet Mondrian in his painting of a bright blue ice shack on, Mount, on a Mount Desert Island lake. Fry based this painting actually on a photo that I posted on Facebook. This is Mondrian's Ice Shack, 2014. Never know where you're going to find your, your subjects. The arched footbridge in Solmesville is among the most photographed subjects in New England, appearing in numerous calendars and photo essays. Working with artists Carol Shutt and Dan Fernald, eighth grade students at Mount Desert Elementary School painted the bridge as it looks in midwinter, an icy but beautiful scene. This is, a, yeah, this is their mural at the elementary school. While we're in Soamsville, Allison Rector traces her series of library paintings to encountering, quote, the placid sweep of light falling across the floor at the Blue Hill Library one day in 2010 which drew her into an illuminated reading room. Since then, working from her studio in Monroe, Maine, she has painted some 45 main libraries, including several on this island. In this portrait of the humble Soamsville Library, a boardwalk protects the walkway during the wet spring season. This is Alice, oh, sorry, but it's always been a delight. We lived, uh, oh, there it is. You'll be working now. Um, that's the library. That's the library I was talking about. And we're looking at the bridge. I think so. This is Allison Rector's. Thank you, Owen. This is Allison Rector's April, um, 2014. Uh, a, a wonderful spot, uh, despite all the uh, geese poop that you have to walk around. <laughs> um, I want to conclude with a group of artists who passed away since Art of Acadia came out in 2016. Edith Wright, who made the trip from her home in Atlanta to Islesford every summer, captured the bustle of the comings and goings of the island dock in this whimsical watercolor. In many ways, the docks on Little Cranberry and Great Cranberry are the centers of the community, where year-rounders and visitors mingle, and where the mail boat arrives every day, carrying news from the rest of the world. Wright was employed by Time, Inc. and the Whitney Museum and Phillips Gallery, all her life, she painted, studying watercolor technique at the Atlanta School of Art, along with other classes with the likes of Little Cranberry artist Ashley Bryan and Henry Isaacs. She passed away in 2018 at age 89. This is her town doc, 1995, of watercolor. Lopez Point, in the village of Bernard, overlooking Blue Hill Bay, has been a favorite haunt of a number of artists, including the late Robert Goodman, who painted on the island for more than 50 years. Every summer, starting in 1970, he traveled with his wife, Sonny, Sonny, from Brooklyn, New York, to a cabin on Echo Lake. His approach was impressionistic, capturing each island view with energized brushwork. I read his obituary recently, and 
learned so much about his life. I wish I had known that I could have talked to him about it. He worked for the United Nations for 35 years in a fellowship program to educate students from developing countries. And in 2019, received a Lifetime Achievement Award for his UN work. He was also president of the UN Art Club for many years and organized art shows to benefit UNICEF. He passed away in 2021 at age 96. Uh, he was a friend, as many of these artists were. This is his Trees and Marshes at Locus Point acrylic from 2014. Mount Desert Island is not without its overcast days, but as the famed Greek and Roman historian Edith Hamilton once noted in a letter, I so love it up here on Mount Desert Island that rain and fog are nicer here than good weather elsewhere. <laughs> Constance La Palomara, who escaped to Mount Desert Island from New Haven every summer, captured one of those darkened days in this moody seawall seascape. La Palomaro earned a BA in political science from Manhattanville College in 1957 and worked for the CIA in Washington in the early 1960s. She later worked for the Russian Institute at Columbia University. Later in life, she took up painting, studying at the Yale School of Art and the Tyler School of Art and Architecture at Temple University. Working primarily in oils, she was a landscape and still life painter who painted from direct observation. I remember she was also a fierce competitor on the tennis courts at the Causeway Club. She passed away this past February at age 87. This is clearing Seawall, 2012. Bar Harbor architect Rock Caivano, who designed the Jordan Palm House and the Soamsville Bridge, and helped transform the former naval base at Skudik into an educational complex, practiced watercolor in his free time. One of his favorite spots was this rustic lookout on the trail from Peabody Drive to the Thuya Garden, one of many places on the island where one is invited to take it all in. After attending Dartmouth College and the Yale School of Architecture, Caivano lived in New Haven while he made animated shorts for Sesame Street and the electric company. During this time, he made, I'd love to see this, I can't find it online. He made the animated film, Air Conditioned Comfort, which highlighted the perils of consumptive tourism and the wisdom of Smokey the Bear. The film was shown nightly at the Criterion Theater throughout the 1980s. I know. Anybody remember that? I'd love to see that. In 1974, responding to an ad in the New York Times, Caivano took a position at the College of the Atlantic where he started the environmental design program. In 1983, he and his family moved to Philadelphia where he worked for Venturi, Roche, and Scott Brown as an associate. And then they returned to Mount Desert Island. And for the next 25 years, he designed all kinds of things all over this island. After retiring in 2013, he pretty much painted full time. He died in 2021 at age 77. This is Studio Lookout, 2013. This intimate watercolor of the Thuya Garden by Paul Rickert includes a glimpse of one of the concrete garden urns fabricated by Eric Solderhos, a Swedish immigrant who set up a studio in West Goolsboro. Today, Luniform in Sullivan fabricates various vessels, some of them based on his designs. Rickert was born in Philadelphia. His father, William Henry Rickert, was an artist and illustrator. After serving in the combat artist program in Vietnam, he had been drafted at age 19. The build, oh, yeah, here it goes again. All right. There we go. Yeah, thanks for the heads up. Let's see if we can fix that. Here. first came to Maine after reading Elliot Porter's Summer Island about the famed photographer's life on Great Spruce Head Island uh, in, in, in Penobscot Bay. Became a frequent visitor, painting up and down the coast with a special passion for Stonington and Acadia. He bought, a, he bought a modest home in Brooksville on a whim in 1973. He ended up painting the coast of Maine for the rest of his life, making the trek from his home in Chestnut Hill, Pennsylvania, nearly every summer to paint. You may have remembered he showed for many years the Brink Spring Gallery in, um, in, uh, in Northeast Harbor. This is his Thuya Garden, 
of 2000. A longtime resident of Searsmont in Midcoast, Maine, Yvonne Jaquette explored the Maine landscape from the air. In this semi pointillist view of Ilaho, the island and surrounding water transformed into luminous entities. Born in Pittsburgh in 1934, Jaquette first came to Maine in 1954 while a student at the Rhode Island School of Design. Her focus on aerial views started by going up in little airplanes in Maine, she said in an interview. Her first experience was not, was not pleasant. She became dizzy, confused, and nauseous when she got home, but she kept at it. These, those flights over the mid-coast led to Jaquette's signature subject, the world viewed from on high, pushing the bird's eye view tradition to new heights she painted urban and rural landscapes based on studies made from elevated outlooks, planes, small and large, helicopters, tall buildings, including the World Trade Center, and the top of Mount Batty overlooking Camden. Over time, she became America's preeminent aerial artist. She passed away this past April at age 88. This is her Bard Island, Idaho, Maine, too. 2012. Maine became a centering place for Ashley Bryan in 1946 when he attended the first summer session of the Skowhegan School of Painting and Sculpture. On trips to the Mount Desert Island region, he discovered Islesburg, a tight-knit community of fishermen families. The island embraced its award-winning children's book author and illustrator with full-scale affection. The Islesburg School was renamed the Ashley Bryan School. 2012, and the next year, his extraordinary sea glass renderings of biblical scenes were installed in the Islesford Congregational Church. He passed away in February 2022 at age 99. Uh, if you get a chance, uh, the Clark Point Gallery in Southwest Harbor is showing the, his original la uh, collages for the last book he illustrated uh, called Blooming Beneath the Sun, Poems by Christina Rossetti. And that shows up through September. So on the left, you have Ashley Bryant's Bobby Shafto's Gone to Sea, 2008, the wood, wood, woodblock print. And I wanted to mention this print, uh, which takes its title from an English Irish folk song, A Nursery Rhyme, was produced in a limited edition to benefit Islesford Boat Works, a summer boat building program for children on Little Cranberry Island. And it's, I think, one of the few landscapes that Ashley ever did. Of, of the area. And then on the right is uh, one of his uh, sea glass, stained glass pieces, nativity scene from the 1970s. In the end, the art inspired by Mount Desert Island and, and its surroundings creates a kind of marvelous tapestry of imagery, a quilt not unlike the one Ruth Westfall, a longtime resident of Great Cranberry, is shown sewing in a painting by fellow islander Winnie Smart. Originally from New Jersey, Smart fell in love with the Maine coast when she first visited as a teenager. She returned often over the years, painting landscapes and seascapes. She opened a Smart Studio Gallery, still going strong in Northeast Harbor, in 1967. In 1984, she moved to Great Cranberry Island and was an early member of the Great Cranberry Island Historical Society. I used to see Winnie on the Cranberry Isles mailboat. On a couple of occasions, she asked, with a mischievous smile, when I was going to include her work in one of my books. I was glad to feature two of her paintings in Art of Acadia, this one, and there's also a beautiful watercolor of the Rockefeller Gardens. Ruth Westfall, I also wanted to mention, uh, the subject of this painting appears in a wonderful new book called The Great Cranberry Island Portrait Project, a collection of drawings and prints by Janet Badger, interviews by Becky Byers. It just came out. Um, I recommend it. I end with a salute to the recent collaboration between the Far Harbor Historical Society and Artways, the cleverly titled From Hudson to Harbor. Here are a few of the paintings created for the event. A left to right, Carol Shutt, Joie, Oil on Linen, Caitlin Miller, Bountiful, Acrylic on Canvas, Lee Culver, At the Mouth of Monument Cove, Watercolor, 
and below, Judy Taylor, Boathouses on Islesford, Gouache. These paintings and the others in that show underscore the fact that this island continues to be the inspiration for many, many wonderful images. Thank you for listening to these remarks. I'd be glad to take any questions. I appreciate you being here. Thank you.